two. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I call to order the Board of Education of Baltimore County's public hearing on board policies 5550 and 5560 on school climate and student discipline. This evening's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live. The registration form for the public hearing was available to the public online and closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's hearing. Speakers' names will be called in the order of registration and the next speaker's name will also be called and asked to be on deck and ready to provide their comments. While we encourage public input on board policies 5550 and 5560, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to these policies. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Each speaker will be given three minutes to speak on board policies 5550 and 5560 and school climate and student discipline. This public hearing is not the forum to speak on any other topics. I ask speakers to observe the three minute limit and conclude remarks when time has expired and you hear the tone. The call will be ended if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to the policies. The first speaker tonight is Diana Bergman, who will be followed by Cheryl Pasteur. Ms. Senna, it doesn't, it doesn't appear that Ms. Bergman's on the call yet. Thank you. Our speaker then is Ms. Cheryl Pasteur. Welcome. Good evening. Am I on? You are on. Hello? You are on. Welcome. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, in 1996, while at Loyola, I read as a part of my coursework a book called Other People's Children by Lisa Delpit, and later Baltimore County had its principals reading it, so I bought it for my staff. One thing that I recall in it is that nothing touches us until it touches us. And that seems to be uh, the case now. We see that, particularly after the pandemic, there's so many things that are changing and have changed for our children, our staff, for the board, for us. And we are seeing behaviors that in many ways mimic some of the behaviors that children are seeing from their adults. I don't minimize what I see in our schools because I can't minimize what our children are watching. But what are we going to do to help them? You are looking towards a restorative practices program. I applaud the board for voting for that program because it is one that is going to help school-based people know how to respond to our students. Many of the people on the board indicated that they were interested. I hope so, because it will help you to speak from a point of knowledge and not fear. And real restorative practices will make a difference. And for members of the PRC, I hope that you will go back and look at the re restorative practices that are listed uh, in our policies, and I'm sure that once you do the restorative workshop, you will want to change some of those. Also, uh, Dr. Williams and the board put money in the budget for SROs. I hear people talking about more police presence. We don't need more police presence at our schools. We need those people who know how to work effectively with our students. So let's hope that that money to send them to the National Academy does not get cut because it is way too small for it to be cut. Well, the benefits of it uh, will be enormous on many levels. Our SROs, as well as administrators and many teachers, are able to keep their ears to the proverbial ground and act before the fact, not after. Children tend not to keep uh, their mouths closed about their plans. Also remember when we didn't vote, when the board didn't vote for uh, the bus arm, that one of the things that was on there was real-time cameras. So if 
since that failed, I'm hoping that the board will be looking at opportunities to buy those. Thank you very much. I'm assuming that was my bell. Thank you. The next speaker is Amy Adams, followed by Sarah Valentine. Ms. Adams? Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. I believe you're on mute. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Good evening. I appreciate the board soliciting feedback from the public this evening. We hear from parents, staff, and students who are not content with current BCPS disciplinary practices. We have the BHI form, Safe Schools Maryland hotline, and SROs assigned to our schools. And yet, especially this year, there are frequent reports from schools all over the county of repeated disruptive behavior from a small group of students that goes unchecked and often escalates. Have any of you ever read Why Meadow Died? The People and Policies That Created the Parkland Shooter and Endangered American Students by Andrew Pollack. If not, I highly recommend it. Many policies implemented in this Parkland, Florida school are very familiar to what we hear from our children. Locked bathrooms, disruptive students remaining in class, etc. I worked as a psychiatric nurse prior to having my family. Not that I want our schools to be like a locked psych ward, but I think there's something we can use as perspective. I worked with adults in severe mental crisis. They were required to conform to unit standards for preservation of their safety and safety of the other patients and staff. If they were unable to meet the unit standards of behavior, there were consequences. They lost privileges or went on one-on-one -on -one observation. The point is, if adults in severe acute mental crisis can be held to behavioral standards, then surely our students can as well, regardless of their underlying issues. These issues can and should be addressed, but not used as a path to avoid discipline. I think that policy 5550 is well written and read well, and the statement reads well. I think many parents, students, and staff are wondering how section A2 and A3 in the standards are implemented. How are sections C, D, and F in the standards also being implemented? The offenses are clearly defined and sorted into three categories of increasing severity. Policy 5560 is also very well written and clear. I think the breakdown in what is happening in our schools is the implementation and follow through. I would like to see statistics for expulsion, extended suspension, in-school suspension, short and long-term suspension, placement in alternative education programs for the last five years. Perhaps if these practices were actually occurring, some of the disruptive and dangerous behaviors would be lessened. It's our duty as adults to teach children life skills while they are in K through 12 schools. One skill is how to behave appropriately in school and later in a professional setting. Another important life skill is personal accountability and coping with consequences for one's actions, good or bad. And the last life, last life skill I'll mention tonight is conflict resolution or restorative justice practices. It is important, but should not replace accountability and consequences. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Valentine and on deck will be Carmuda Vogel. Ms. Valentine? Hello? Yes, good evening. Hi, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Um, good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Sarah Valentine, and I'm the parent of a sixth grade student in BCPS. I knew the transition from elementary to middle was going to be a difficult one, but was vastly unprepared for what would soon become my son's reality. Daily assaults, arson, deadly weapons, and even shootings quickly replaced recess and circle time. My once carefree son now consistently has to worry if he will fall victim to an act of violence. BCPS claims to be committed to fostering safe, secure, and supportive learning environments. However, this past year has proven otherwise. While BCPS's multi-tiered system of supports model does a decent job outlining available services and supports, 
Unfortunately, the implementation of this framework is flawed. Tier one and tier two, which encompass a vast majority of the student population, approximately 95%, focus heavily on prevention with minimal attention given to intervention. Can antecedent manipulations and environmental, environmental modifications be effective? Yeah, sure, if they're consistently implemented with high levels of integrity across settings. Are prevention measures alone enough to significantly decrease the unprecedented level of severe behaviors BCPS is currently facing? Absolutely not. Anyone with rudimentary knowledge of behavior modification can tell you reinforcement-based procedures are those which increase positive behaviors, while punishment procedures result in a decrease in negative behaviors. While reinforcement alone is not sufficient, punishment can and should be incorporated into behavior management plans. I shouldn't have to say this, but for those unaware, proactive strategies are intended to interrupt negative behavior prior to its occurrence. They're essentially useless once the behavior has occurred. Clear and consistent expectations and consequences are baseline needs for safe and effective schools. While discretion is appropriate for minor offenses, we need to reintroduce zero tolerance for violent offenses. BCS, BCPS is currently in a state of disciplinary crisis. Our students are literally terrified to go to school. We need behavioral policies that act immediately to reduce the current level of violence within our buildings. As adults, it is our responsibility to provide students with safe, secure learning environments by any means necessary. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Carmita Vogel and on deck will be Christy Cacheras. Ms. Vogel. Ms. Carmita Vogel, if you're on the line. Okay. Christy Cacheras. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so, my name is Christy Caceres, and um, I am the parent, I have four children in Baltimore County, um, and they range in age from uh, five years old to 14 years old. Um, and I don't have anything written out like the other people do. I feel like very impressed that they were, that they had everything really coherent. Um, I just, I, you know, to be honest with you, in the last week, I've dealt with two assaults against two different children in two different schools um, in my home. So um, it's been really a chaotic, <laughs> a really chaotic week. So um, I, you know, I'm kind of here to, in a very fresh way, um, speak to some of the things that uh, I wish um, in terms of discipline and the whole process for when I, you know, have a concern. Um, like, you know, I've had it a couple different times just in the last week, but more than just twice in within this year. Um, what the first speaker uh, spoke to is absolutely true. I think that we do have um, a lot of mental health issues as a result of quarantine, pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. But what the other um, speakers also spoke to is what I've sort of experienced, and that is, um, you know, the follow through and implementation and the integrity of um, what is written versus what is actually done is very different. And so, you know, what I would speak to is, is definitely accountability for the administrators. Um, something I really wish was implemented was some, almost like a duty to inform. I had no idea about the BHI forms. I, I'm sure it came home in some pamphlet somewhere in the beginning of the year, but I feel like, you know, one thing that I wish I would have been informed of is the process um, when I went to an administrator and expressed concern about my child being hurt. Um, and so I kind of had to find it out for myself, but that wasn't until way, way after the first incident happened. Um, and so, you know, just lack of uh, being informed of the process is something. And the other thing is, and I've heard this uh, from a lot of other families, um, 
is just it's almost, it feels sometimes like we're sending our kids to fight club um and it's really really sad and scary um and so i i really would urge also the board to think about some balances between um, protections for victims and protections for the offenders um once a couple things that i really wished is that i knew what the consequences were um I, you know we can't be told who the offenders are thank you but that's time ma'am but if you have additional thoughts you'd like to share with the board, you're welcome to email those to boe at bcps.org. And I encourage anyone listening to also reach out to us and use that email address um, at any time to reach out to the board as well. Our next speaker is Benjamin Heiser and on deck will be Timothy Getz. Mr. Heiser? I don't believe Mr. Heiser's on. Okay. The next speaker is Timothy Getz. Mr. Getz? Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Great, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Timothy Getty, and I have three children that attend pre-K, second grade, and fourth grade in BGPS. I just want to say Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition is a great resource for any parents out there. Uh, academics and safety should be number one priorities in BGPS, and is my expectation for the system. However, based on recent academic assessments and the increase in school violence, the system is broken and change introspection and result oriented policies are required to improve the education system in Baltimore County. I appreciate the board taking the initial steps to reviewing policies and questions and I hope this isn't the last of, of these efforts. A uh, review of policy uh, 5550, there's considerable emphasis on the word may and respect uh, with respect to paragraph four uh, or IV. I understand the board's desire to empower uh, school administrators to make their own determination of disciplinary policy with their school, but may is a suggestive uh, word. It's not definitive. I recommend a may be replaced with will in paragraphs IV A1, IV B1, IV uh, C1. Paragraphs IV um, A1 B identifies fighting as a a suspendable offense, but this needs to be clarified that self-defense does not qualify under the terms of fighting. If a student's life is uh, threatened, they need to be allowed to defend their own life without being subjected to school punishment. Uh, in order to reduce the amount of administrative negligence, paragraph four uh, needs to provide actual implementation guidance instead of leaving it up to the superintendent. What is missing from this policy is an enforcement structure that will ensure that students are held accountable for their actions according to the identified categories. For instance, a scoring system could be implemented where points are assigned for each offense of category. And when a student reaches a certain threshold, it will trigger an automatic disciplinary action. Uh, in regards to 5560 paragraph 2 M1, stage that restorative practices is conducted by a quote, trained staff, but what does this mean? Uh, adding the training requirements or references to what qualifies a person to be trained and quote restorative practices uh, would be uh, helpful. Uh, 5560 paragraph IV B2, the teacher or a teacher aid or the originator of the report against a student needs to be involved in the decision if the student can re-enter the classroom, not just simply the administrator and the health professional. This is in regards to uh, a child in pre-K through second grade that is being considered for suspension um, based on their uh, behavior. <clears throat> uh, five, five, policy 5560 paragraph D A2, quote, in school removal is not defined. This isn't a term used in policy 5550. Either the term needs to be <clears throat> the term or restructure the sentence to state uh, and in school suspension is not applicable to a student removed from the regularly scheduled program. Uh, in paragraph, thank you. I will send my comments. Thank you. And I understand Ms. Bergman has joined. Ms. Bergman, are you on the line? Ms. Bergman? 
Do you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. My name is Dana Bergman, and as we have all heard, even more recently last night, um, the potential for negative repercussions in the lives of disciplinary students leads to some of the to demand a more careful prescription of school discipline, especially as many discipline practice results in unequal treatment of black individuals, people of color, students, and students living in poverty. School discipline tends to disproportionately impact students with disability, students of racial and ethnic minority status, and students of low social economic status. With this group, black students tend to encounter the highest rates of disciplinary measure in both public and private school. So I believe Tuesday night, Dr. Williams carefully shared that if we wanted to set things right in this country across the nation, we had to really dig into policies, policies like this, because we have so many children inappropriately getting disciplined at alarming high rates. And through research demonstrates that black children are now more likely to misbehave than white children, yet we see the disproportion in those numbers. And we have to do better because the segregation of Baltimore County is not helping the situation. These policies that is unjustly treating students like they're different and should be treated different because of the color of, sin, of their skin is not acceptable. And where is it in the policy where we're encouraging how we communicate with one another to be able to work together and problem solve and use our critical thinking skills to resolve conflict and create solutions. So look at this policy carefully, both of these policies, they go hand in hand and make sure you do right by our students in our future because this country together has to work in making a difference for every single child regardless of how much money is in their parents' bank, regardless of the color or shade of their skin. We have a responsibility to create leaders, not influence people in a negative way by discouraging them and, and treating them so unjust. So that's all I have to say today. Best wishes to everybody and thank you to per Cheryl Pursu for speaking up. I really appreciate the feedback you gave tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Are either Ms. Vogel or Mr. Pfizer on the line? Ms. Vogel is on the line. She may be having trouble unmuting. Uh, Ms. Vogel, if you can hit star six, that might help. Thank you. Ms. Vogel? Okay, we're still unable to hear you. Oh, no. Hello? Now we can hear you. Great. Okay. This is me to vocal. I apologize. I seem to have a phone that is having a mind of its own. Anyway, thank you for letting me speak tonight. I appreciate that you all are uh, doing this. I, I think it's interesting that pa how parents are talking about what's going on in schools when we're talking about development of policy. Um, policy by very nature should be proactive in moving forward. And I guess my biggest concern are two things. One, we discussed restorative practice programs, which are lovely. That being said, the buy-in and the staff requirements for such a program is extreme. Um, BCPS does not have the staffing right now to implement any type of restorative practice program with any level of trueness to what it, is, it should be. I, it's not clear to me why BCPS continually diminishes the value and need of two things. One, smaller class sizes, and two, staff that can intervene to do this. We have unprecedented levels of trauma in children right now, 
And I know trauma is a big buzzword and everybody's throwing it around and, and there's a whole lot of misinformation out there. But the reality is, is that we have kids that not only are dealing with trauma in, home, in their homes, but are also dealing with unbelievable trauma based on pandemic, based on community, based on the world, everything else. Kids that are dealing with trauma do not have the emotional energy to regulate their emotions. And so we can put all these wonderful things in, we can put cops in, we can take cops out, we can send people off to conferences to learn about restorative justice. But the reality is, if you all don't put in the adults that are going to handle this, nothing is going to change. I had the kid that was hurt by the other kid. I had the problems with getting to school to address the situation. And I've been a lifetime social worker. I'm not speaking from not knowing what this is all about. But until BCPS puts the focus on actually putting staff and adults with the training and the ability to address this stuff in schools, none of this is going to change, period, at all. And I, it fascinates me that that's not the focus. I don't care about kids being suspended. I don't care about kids being expelled because if that's the point that the kid has gotten to, then the school system has failed them. We have to be proactive and we're just not. We're talking about conduct problems, but we're not addressing the root of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vogel. The next item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 22nd at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us this evening. Ms. And this, this hearing is adjourned. Good evening. Ms. Hen.